Hi everyone, I'm Jody Buter, Tempo's Director of Marketing US. Thank you for joining our technical session today on data disaster recovery and backup. Today we're going to be talking about how a Tempo Myria simplifies the backup of your petabyte scale storage with a storage aware file oriented data management platform. We'll talk about how Tempo Myria can recover lost files or full storage content in open format on any file system with preserved ACLs. We'll talk about how a Tempo Myria delivers a solution that scales as your data grows to billions of files and petabytes of data. And finally, we'll talk about how Myria reroutes production to the backup repository with Myria Snap Store in the event of an incident on your high capacity primary storage. Should you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to drop them into the questions tab. And note there will be some time after the presentation for a live Q&A session. Now I'd like to introduce you all to our speaker today, Senior Pre-Sales Engineer for our Tempo, Mike Oates. Hey, thanks, Jody. So welcome everyone. I am going to switch my screen real quick. So don't be surprised when things change. And there we go. So as Jody said, my name is Mike Oaks. I'm a senior solution architect, pre-sales engineer with the Tempo. And I've been with the company a little over three years, but I've been in the data preservation, data pr protection, storage industry now about 35 years. So a little bit uh, dating myself. What I'd like to do is real quickly, an overview of the Tempo, just short, one slide or so. A little bit about Miri, and then we'll dive into how Miri and some of its pillars help with disaster recovery and data backup in the healthcare industry and others. So that being said, I'm going to jump into it because I quite a few slides in a short amount of time. So a tempo. We've been around, as you can see on the screen here, well, about 30 years now in data preservation, data protection. That's where we got our start. Well north of 2,000 customers and well north of 250 employees throughout the organization. And what we do is we preserve and manage data, our data ecosystems for mid and large size corporations, Fortune 500s. What I, what I mean by that is our solutions, and it says on the screen, protect, store, move, retrieve, but also think management or data management, because you have to understand your data ecosystem, regardless of what vertical it's in, and across your organization, so you can effectively manage it. Or manage it sorry. So that being said, how do we do that? Now, Miria, there's five pillars and there's five distinct pillars, but they're all underneath the same software product. And Miri is an all software product, just so you guys know. It's designed from the ground up to enable backup and archive. And that's what we're going to be mostly talking about today. But there's some other features that I want to mention real quick. You see down at the five o'clock position, Miri for migration. Think of this as when you need to collapse storage locations or collapse colos, taking things to new storage and basically, you know, decommissioning legacy storage. So it's something you'd use over uh, a time or time base. Think of it as a rental. You don't need to buy something in a perpetuity. You only need it for three months or six months and then shut it off, reducing your overhead costs or your CapEx or OpEx. The other one is to the left at the nine o'clock position, uh, Miri for data moving. Think of this as synchronization, replication, task called easy move, allow people to, sell, to self move data between locations or even self retrieve data off of archives or backup. So it kind of wraps into the archive and backup. The reason why I mention all of these, there is, they do different functions, right? 
on, on excuse me on top of the hood underneath the hood though they're all using the same data movement engine the reason for this is if you see the top one at 12 o'clock position mirror for analytics this currently is a standalone offering from us, but we're rolling it in to Myria in November at no cost. If you have one of our other workflows with a license and support contract, you can glean information, not only of things we've acted upon, but everything external to us. So you may have a petabyte we're managing for you, but you have 17 petabytes external. You can glean information about it. No cost. Understand where it lies. Now, if you want to manage it, you just have to make sure your license for the capacity you want to manage like backing up or archiving it, fits in the current license you have. So just wanted to bring that up. Those are the five pillars. We're really going to talk about Miri for backup mostly today and a little bit about archiving. So that being said, what are some of the data management challenges and the protection challenges we address, right? So data security and integrity, big, especially in the healthcare industry. You got to be able to secure the data, whether it be patient records or something else. Keeping it secure, ensuring its integrity, both through a hash mechanism, maybe you need to encrypt, maybe you need to encrypt in flight, right? And we can do that if you have different locations and you can put our data movers and data movers are just software sitting on some type of appliance. Now, it could be on top of a, a Windows box or a Linux box. And we have complete sizing guidelines. I think I mentioned this earlier to help you or ha we help you when we do these type of engagements to size the system accordingly. And they're not big. When I say data movers, Two CPUs, it's base metal, two CPUs, 16 cores per CPU, maybe 16 or 32 gigs of memory, and a NIC card. Not a lot here. But we can encrypt in flight. We can encapsulate that data. You can give us an encryption key. We can use SSL TLS version 1.3 and secure that data in flight. We can also do encryption at rest. Maybe it's on the tape drives. Maybe it's on a particular piece of storage. If it provides it, we'll go into that storage and lay the data down. If it doesn't, we're going to have some features that allow you to encrypt at rest. Also, very, very important, both from understanding the security of your system, right? Audit logging, audit trails, not just for own administration use, but what about if you need to do forensics because you've been hacked or something's been deleted? Anything we take action upon, we log, right? All deletes, all moves, all copies, everything. The other big thing here, what we address too, is multiple vendor support. If we can talk to some appliance 99% of the time, we can facilitate data management, data movement, archive and backup on it, right? That's across mediums. When I say different storages, it could be ethernet, IP over IB, fiber channel, iSCSI, SAS, and the multitude of others. We do that coupled with, we're able to do multiple file systems, right? Because natively, an Isilon doesn't talk to a NetApp, which doesn't talk to a Cumulo, which doesn't talk to GPFS. I'm just using those as examples. They're all basically islands of storage. We can take those storages and put them together in a heterogeneous infrastructure, allowing you to take advantage of the best of both worlds, move data from hot storage to cold storage, manage it effectively, use it for backups where you couldn't before. That's coupled with using cloud, both on-prem and off-prem. Now, in some cases, it may not make sense to use off-prem, so use on-prem. As long as it's something that talks S3, Swift, we can address it. You know, public cloud, AWS, GCP, Azure, we can also address those if need be. And the last one, the big one here for, for a lot of really, if you want to do security, air gapping your data. Now, that usually means taking it to tape. It's really the only true way to air gap it right now, right? Some people say air gap like, which we can do because you can shut things off with networks and so forth. But true air gapping is to put it on tape and stick it in a vault or stick it in a shelf. We can do that as well. We have uh, complete access to tape drives or tape libraries. <clears throat> Excuse me. But what I'll tell you with a tape library perspective, just make sure you're using base metal. Don't use the virtual machines. Virtual machines do not do well with tape libraries. So that being said, how do we do what we do? So some of those big things, how do we do some of that information I was talking about? The big thing here from a backup perspective in any organization is reducing that window of vulnerability, one, and also ensuring security. So from the reducing the window of vulnerability standpoint, how do we do that? Those data movers, those agents I was talking about earlier, all they're doing is moving data from point A to point B. That's, that's their whole function. They're controlled by a single server or an HA server that part was excuse me, parses out jobs, but you can control how those jobs work and you can pool those data movers together. And when you pull them together and a task is set up, you can start to use them in a paralyzed fashion by saying, you know, how much data 
maybe it's been found when I'm doing a walk looking for data, or it's run for so much time, or maybe it's found so many files, and that's set those as your high water marks. If it finds one of those, pick it up, start moving that data immediately to its to its backup location. We're going to store all this, as was mentioned earlier, all those ACLs, all those permissions in our database for an inline replay so we can do cross-platform cross retrieval if need be. And then we'll keep looking for more data. Every time we hit a high watermark, we'll put it on another data mover until we fill up those sub jobs that have been set for, for that particular task. Now, the beauty of this is we're paralyzing across data movers. Now, those cores I mentioned earlier on about data movers, you know, 16 cores maybe on in a, for CPU, we turn those into copy engines. So we multi, so we multi-thread through the data mover and we parallelize across. So this really helps a lot of small files, records files, you know, small information, text files. We can actually get the performance up because we can do multiple threads on multiple systems, getting that data protected that much quicker. Coupled with that, there's some other technologies native to some of the appliances we talked to that allow us to do snapshots. Maybe like an Isilon or a Cumula or something along those lines. We can use that native API techno that native technology and trigger a snapshot. And we use that snapshot as a pointer into the file system. First time we pack up data, we'll use it to, to walk the file system and move all the data to its final resting place or places because maybe you want two copies. And oh, by the way, you can have two copies and independent hashes and we can do hash checks when we retrieve the file to make sure, we talked about security integrity before, to make sure that file is the same as it was the day it was read and stored. Now, doing the snapshot's fine, but there's one final piece that, how does this help us move data that much faster? The next time around we do an incremental, we'll trigger another snapshot. We use the FastScan tool at the bottom. And FastScan and snapshot kind of go together. It will actually take the those two, the snapshots, excuse me, and tell the appliance, give me a differential change list. Now we'll take that change list instead of having to walk the file. It's now our, basically our address list into what we need to go move inside the storage. We'll move only those files that have changed or been modified or been newly created without having to walk the file system. When we're done, we validate the new snapshot, delete the old to save space. And every time we do an incremental after that, we'll just keep doing snapshot compares. Now you can turn it on and off if you want, if you want to do a full walk. It's completely configurable underneath the tool. But this is really important to get that data protected, that window of vulnerability shrunk that I was talking about. So Jody mentioned something called SnapStore. When you hear SnapStore, think backup and DR in a single appliance, right? Reducing footprint. Now we do this just like we do a normal backup. The difference here is in this slide that you see here, <clears throat> excuse me, you have your production file system in the middle with the green arrow going to it. Off to the right, you see your NAS backup repository. We can use FastScan, or we don't have to use FastScan on the source side. It just makes it faster if we do. When well, first time we do a backup, we're going to seed all data to that backup repository. Now, the difference when you're using SnapStore than a standard backup. In a standard backup, as I think I mentioned, you store, we store all permissions, ACLs, POSIX, file system metadata in our database, and it's searchable. Right, users go in search, administration go in and search, find that data, search on it, keywords, and so forth. When we do it in SnapStore, we're still going to have it in the database, but we're also going to put all of that on the backup target. Why? So in the case of a failure, you can actually switch users to run on it. And I'm going to show you that in a second. Now, what becomes important here, I'm going to click the page for a second. This one here, we do in the SnapStore and something will fail. Now, the important part here is, being able to do snapshots on the repository because we want it to be a DR and a backup. So the first time we see data, we put it on the backup. The second time around, when we do an incremental, we're gonna take those changes, we're gonna move it or, or start the move to the repository, the backup repository. And at that point in time, we'll trigger a snapshot. This gives us our backup and our versioning. So now we have a DR and full backup. Now in the case of a failure, IT just simply moves the users to that NAS or backup repository. You can continue to run. This takes the pressure off. Let's find out what happened. Did I lose a network connection? Was there a nefarious act? Did the, the system just go down for some reason because it had a hardware error? All software and excuse me, all services can be run on the backup system. Gives you time to reconstitute, fix whatever happened on the primary storage side. And once you've done that, 
where you can actually sync back the other direction, all new changes, or maybe have to reconstitute the file system from the backup. You can do that while running on it. And once you're done, you switch the users back to basically your, your primary storage and now re-enable the snap store and it starts running again and doing all backups and all version controls back to the NAS repository, the backup repository. Really nice tool, allows you to consolidate basically infrastructure and put it in a distant location if need be to. And we can encrypt in flight, as I mentioned earlier, between data movers to keep everything secure. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I did want to show this real quick. There is, from a backup perspective, a full web interface API. Now we can interface with LDAP and AD for authentication. We still require administrators to authenticate, excuse me, to authorize groups and users to talk to repositories. If a user or group does not have access to a repository, a piece of storage, it's not that they, it's grayed out. They don't even know about it. It's not seen. What I wanted to show you here is in this, this little quick session here is you see, we have a couple of repositories. We can drill into one. In this case, we went into video backup for this particular one. You have the notion of being able to go through time navigation. You can also pick a particular point in time. There's a little search piece up here. I can click on that, search by criteria, search by metadata. If you want to put metadata tagging after the fact, putting names or information inside the metadata, you can do that with the tool. You can also trigger a restore right from here or a retrieval of a file. So you found the one you want, you click on it. And you notice here, we have several versions from February 9th to December 8th, back in 2020. Off to the right, the one we've highlighted has all the information about it. This one didn't happen to have a digest, but if you stored one, because you can assign digest to what we call storage manager containers. Containers just a place you're putting data from our representational standpoint. You would have all that information below here, but you see you have the tape, the time, the sizes, when it was last updated, all the current information for that file. If you want to restore it, you just click on this little restore button here. It'll immediately take you into a tool called Easy Move. Easy Move already tells you, hey, I want this file. It's already been highlighted, selected. All you're going to do over here is tell it the place you want to retrieve it to. Now, you have to have access to it. So that means you've been granted access to it. It may be your local PC. It may not if you're not allowed to do that. It may be a particular system within the, the cluster or it could be some distant system as long as you have access to it. Once you're done, you just tell it, hey, validate. It will start the movement. And again, all of this will be logged in the audit trail. This user did this from this location to this location and this file files or directories. One last piece. <clears throat> I mentioned early on about analytics and understanding the landscape, right? Understanding that ecosystem. There's four distinct phases to doing that. So, and the first one here, it's discover. I've had to discover my data. Then I need to do some analysis on it. Then I need to make a decision and I need to act upon that decision. So the mirror for analytics right now sits standalone, if I didn't mention it earlier, allows you to discover, the analyze, you can make those decisions and then act by setting up tasks inside of Myria. When we roll version two, I think two or 2.1 into Myria in November, we're gonna actually be able to now, you can do the discover, analyze, decide and act manually straight from the GUI. What do I mean by that? You can start to tag things. Say, I want to back this up. I want to archive this. I want to move this. And it, we'll go out on the backside and we'll do that work. Now, the, the thing about this, right? So discovering that data, right? These dashboards, and you're seeing a, a dashboard here from version one, are configurable. You can configure them. You can configure your landing pages. You can have multiple dashboards. You can have local resource groups giving users or admins in a particular only access and information about particular pieces of storage, while others may have a global view. And you can keep, just like you can interface with LDAP and AD, same here. And anything I'm doing here, or you're seeing in this GUI and the other GUIs, all open REST API. So if you want to program to it, you can. HTTP and or HTTPS you can actually do. Now, one of the big things here is the reason I'm, I bring these and I'm doing these quickly and I apologize. You have to understand the data. That's that analyze part. So every file that we go and analyze and you can do it whether we have direct access to that storage, maybe it's an NFS or an SMB share or something along those lines or a remote, we call an offline crawler. That crawler maybe uh, Windows or Linux and has access to that storage and it builds a tar file or a, a, basically a compressed file. 
you can take that back into the analytics server and import it. One thing I want to know, none of this analytics information comes back to us. We have no business knowing about your data. Like this is all your data. You're going to control it. Same with Myriad. It's all within your organization. The big thing here about the analyze part is every file gets a unique fingerprint, right? And it's, you know, part of the file name, the digest that's being used, maybe time, date. There's a whole bunch of other things going into it. And all that has metadata with it. And we store that in the Elasticsearch database to make it easily searchable. So you can go in and start ganging searches together. What I mean by that is you may look for something that says Mike. Well, great. I have a million files with Mike in it. That doesn't do me any good. How about I know the creation date, time, size? Does it have hard links? All, all, all kinds of information you can gang together to drill into gets you a much smaller picture of that file. And it'll, it'll change right on the screen. I've gone from a million files to 50 to 20. And then I say, I want to look at the analytics for that stuff. Or I want to look at the data. And then you can roll over it in version two and click on it and start acting upon it. I want to find all files that are 10 terabytes in size, excuse me, 10 megabytes in size and haven't been touched in a year, find them all and move them somewhere else to manage the infrastructure more, um, more easily, or excuse me, more easily, but also more effectively. Now, why has this become important with the fingerprint? Duplicate files. If two files are exactly the same, they're going to have the same fingerprint. You can start to find out I've got 13 files in seven locations. I only needed two. Why do I have 13? Right. The other big one is detecting of anomalies. This is coming in in version 2, 2.1. The data scientists that wrote this code, it's going to learn about file system infrastructures, right? It's going to learn about file system access patterns, I should say. And when I do these talks, I usually like, use the representation of, hey, I'm expecting a data dump every day at noon or once a week at noon on Wednesday. If I get it, I don't care. If I don't get it, I care, right? And the system learns what a normal pattern is and will alert you. Also think of viruses, crypto lockers, when they start coming into the system, hey, abnormal access patterns happening, alert somebody. Very important tool to have. Now, like I said, that's it's not in yet, but it's coming. So, that's kind of like the analytics phase. What have we talked about? I know we did a real quick and a short amount of time here, but right, we talked about data protection, right? Securing it, right? Whether you need to encrypt it, in flight, backing it up, multiple copies, different locations, easily manageable, all run from a single task, or you can run separate tasks if you want. Securing it, again, encryption, in flight or at rest. Data availability. This is where things become important because. Once the data goes up, not only does it need to be available, but when you need it, it needs to be reliable with that security and protection standpoint. So when I go to recall it, I can use those hashes. And if I have it stored in two locations and one location is bad, it'll pull from the other automatically and alert location A, storage manager container A, had an issue. We pulled it from B, need to go fix and take a look at A. But also you have the ability to go run what we call integrity checks. You can run these, you can schedule these to go out and it will walk. If it's a tape, it reads the hash, computes on the file and walks a tape. If it's a storage manager container inside of NAS or something else, we'll go out and we'll walk that and do a hash check. So you can validate the data. So if you put it up today, you can check it every month or every year and know when you're checking it, every time you go check it, everything's good, right? So ensuring that data availability. One other piece that comes with that that isn't mentioned a lot is we believe your data is your data. I call it open data, uh, an open data system. We don't wrap your data in some proprietary wrapper. We can we use tar, we use zip, we use other things. We you know we're going to encrypt it, of course, as an encryption key, but we're not wrapping it. You're not tied to an appliance. You're not being held hostage. If you put your data to tape, whether it be tar or LTFS, and we use both, you can actually put that tape into a drive if you have the encryption key and it's encrypted and untar it or, or see it through LTFS. Same thing with data we put on disks or file systems. You have access to your data. It's your data, you should always be able to get to it. We talked about the analytics already and the cost saving part rolls into all of it, like right? reducing the footprint. I don't need 13 copies of my file, right? Also from a backup perspective, getting things that are old and haven't been touched in some period of time and you set those key business metrics and you can do it from an archive where you can gang that together and say, after so much time, the file hasn't been touched. Maybe it's nine months or two years, and it was created over seven years ago. Archive it. Now leave it on so source or delete it from source. 
or wait 30 days, then delete it from source. You can get pretty granular on how you do these. And actually, that helps reducing the front end cost on your tier one storage. So finally, why a tempo real quickly, right? So we kind of already talked a lot about this at a high level, ability to manage complex data sets. And we are a leading global player in the vendor agnostic structure data. Market. That's a long sentence. What does that mean? We've been doing this for 30 years. We understand and we have in actual production systems that are in the petabytes, 200, 300, 400 petabytes with backup and archive managed on tape or on some type of file system structure or a combination thereof. And we're able to do that because of the wide range support of technology. We can do disk, we can do tape, we can do cloud, we can do file systems. And pretty much any storage model out there, we can usually address it. A very cost effective. If you compare us to most other products on the market, you're going to find us from a feature set. We have a richer feature set and the value you're getting from the product greatly outweighs some of those other products on the market. And then, of course, the analytics we just talked about, understanding your data, that ecosystem, that data ecosystem or landscape that I was talking about. You can't manage it if you don't know about it. And finally, I mentioned we have 250 or north of 250 people. They're scattered throughout the world. Scattered is probably a bad term, but there's we have support organizations in EMEA. We have in the U.S., we have East Coast, West Coast, and also in the middle of the state in, in Texas. And then, of course, Asia Pacific. So you get the idea of a 7 by 24, 365 Sun Never Set support model. You can follow that through the Sun. So if you're having an issue, we can help resolve it. I know I went through a lot of data in a short amount of time, and I took a little bit longer than I thought, but I'm going to turn it back over to Jody and see, does anybody have any questions, comments you want to, want to throw in? Thank you very much, Mike. And that was great. Um, I popped in five questions that came up a couple of them came up from the last time we did this mm -hmm. i do believe as you were talking they were answered but not exactly in okay order so maybe if you want to review really quick oh yeah sure so yeah i'm just looking at the first one does Miriam store data in a format that is not wrapped yeah i just talked about that so open format right tar ltfs we have a format called one to one and it's kind of used in snap store looks just like on target as it did on source um, where does Miria store file metadata? That's a good question. By default, in just a backup or an archive, we're going to store it in the database. It's a Postgres database. Now, if we're talking about analytics, it'll be in the Elasticsearch database. Now, in the case of SnapStore, we're actually going to move it to the, to the target storage. So all that information is on the target storage, just like it was on source. Uh, can we select user tag data for easy search later? Yes, you can. Uh, you can do that either in the analytics tool in version two in November, or you can do it right now within our GUI. Great. Uh, we already answered the next one down. Yes, we can store uh, different storage mediums with different retention times. I didn't mention retention times, but yes, you can have different, you can have multiple storage management containers, maybe one year for some data and then you want to ar keep it archived out later and it's a 10 year and you can have both within the same pool of management. Okay. And the last one we actually already mentioned using the hashes integrity checking to make sure the data, same data you store today is retrievable and accurate five, 10, you know, 15 years down the road. Great. Um, and now I can open it up for Q and A to our audience. Does anyone have any questions for Mike? I don't know if is golden or not. Certainly covered a lot already. And I think some of the popped up questions probably helped as well. So if I don't see anything coming up, I just want to say thank you to all for joining. Um, we'll give you a recording of the session shortly. And if you ever have any questions, um, reach out to us in the chat area. I put our contact information. Um, you can also go on the website. We have a contact form there. And if you have any questions about products and solutions, of course, we go to atempo.com. Thanks again for joining us and have a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.